Well, Elon Musk had promised that he would open up the Twitter files upon taking over, and so he has. So, late Friday night, Matt Taibbi, the former Rolling Stone journalist, he's a left winger, but he's sort of been alienated from the left wing by their wokeness. He released a long thread of information regarding the suspension of the Hunter Biden story in the month leading up to the 2020 election. You'll all remember that in October, the New York Post came up with a story about Hunter Biden's laptop that contained all sorts of prurient information, as well as some rather relevant information about whether Hunter Biden may have been picking up bags of cash using his daddy's last name and whether or not he was actually conveying some of that money over to, quote unquote, the big guy that was testified to by Tony Bobolinsky, a person with whom Hunter Biden was actually doing business. He suggested that Joe was benefiting from his son running around the entire globe, picking up bags of cash in China and in Ukraine and in other parts of the world. Okay, so that story was suspended, you'll remember, from Twitter. If you posted the story, you were suspended from Twitter. And there was a a concerted effort by social media platforms to shut down the distribution of the story, as well as those who were attempting to distribute the story. You'll also recall that Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, he actually said that he was approached by the FBI and told that there was going to be a wave of Russian disinformation. And maybe this was the Russian disinformation. So basically, the social media bros just decided we are not going to allow this information to be disseminated. Didn't make a difference in the election. It didn't make no difference in the election, obviously. Would that have been enough to make Donald Trump the president? Nobody really knows the answer to that question. I, I, on my own, somewhat doubt that given the margin of popular vote victory in the particular states at issue in Arizona and Georgia and Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and all the rest. But with that said, does that mean that the election was rigged? Well, rigged, again, is different than stolen. Stolen is where somebody actually loads the ballot box filled with all sorts of false ballots, or they take a bunch of good ballots and they throw them in the river or something. Rigged means that all of the factors in the election are corruptly changed in order to prevent the election of one candidate or another. Does this thing count under part of rigged? It certainly would. When you have social media making an overt effort to aid one candidate at the expense of another candidate, that obviously is part of rigging the game. Okay, well, here's what Matt Taibbi actually showed. And the the big question here is twofold. One, what is the relationship between Twitter and the Democratic Party? And two, what is the relationship between Twitter, the Democratic Party, and the FBI? And that, that last part is not demonstrated by the Twitter files, as we'll get to. But the Twitter files do show an extraordinarily warm relationship between, let's say, middle management at Twitter and high-ranking members of the Democratic Party. And that, of course, is no surprise. And the middle management problem is a very serious problem at a lot of these big social media companies. This is true also at Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg, for example, he has sort of a congenital like for free speech. He gave an entire speech in 2018 at Georgetown University talking about free speech. That was pretty good. And then his middle management has decided that they're not going to allow free speech. And it seems like the same thing sort of happened over at Twitter. They'll have a founder of a company And then when the founder of the company gives up control to a bunch of people who are the middle management, the middle management just do what they want to do. So here's what Matt Taibbi showed. He was given the files by Elon Musk, and then he put them out there. He said, the Twitter files tell an incredible story from inside one of the world's largest and most influential social media platforms. It is a Frankensteinian tale of a human-built mechanism grown out of control of its designer. Twitter in its conception was a brilliant tool for enabling instant mass communication, making a true real-time global conversation possible for the first time. In an early conception, Twitter more than lived up to its mission statement, giving people, quote, the power to create and share ideas and information instantly without barriers. As time progressed, however, the company was slowly forced to add those barriers. Some of the first tools for controlling speech were designed to combat the likes of spam and financial fraudsters. Slowly over time, Twitter staff and executives began to find more and more uses for these tools. Outsiders began petitioning the company to manipulate speech as well, first a little, then more often, and constantly. Says Matt Taibbi, By 2020, requests from connected actors to delete tweets were routine. One executive would write to another, more to review from the Biden team, and the reply would come back handled. So you'd get the the Biden Democratic campaign basically calling up Twitter and saying, here's a bunch of tweets we don't like, take a look at them. And then Twitter's middle management wouldn't even elevate that to sort of the Jack Dorsey level. They would just say, okay, we handled it, it's gone. Celebrities and unknowns alike could be removed or reviewed at the behest of a political party, says Matt Taibbi. And this includes people including, for example, James Woods. Both parties had access to these tools, says Taibbi. For example, in 2020, requests from both the Trump White House and the Biden campaign were received and honored. However, the system was not balanced. It was based on contact. Because Twitter was and is overwhelmingly staffed by people of one political orientation, there were more channels, more ways to complain open to the left, well, Democrats, than the right. And of course, this is part of the quote-unquote rigged game. And we as a company, we deal, Daily Wire does, with people at Facebook, we deal with people at Twitter, but let us just say that the modes of communication are rather narrow for right-wingers. However, if you are on the left, you have a lot of friends who work at places like Twitter, places like Facebook. And so if you have a complaint, 
it gets handled in short order. As Taibbi says, the resulting slant in content moderation decisions is visible in the documents you're about to read. However, it's also the assessment of multiple current and former high-level executives. He says, the Twitter files, part one, how and why Twitter blocked the Hunter Biden laptop story. On October 14th, 2020, the New York Post published secret Biden emails and expose based on the contents of Hunter Biden's abandoned laptop. Twitter took extraordinary steps to suppress the story, removing links and posting warnings that it may be unsafe. They even blocked its transmission via direct message, a tool hitherto reserved for extreme cases, like, for example, child pornography. White House spokeswoman Kaylee McEnany was locked out of her account for tweeting about the story, prompting a furious letter from Trump campaign staffer Mike Hahn, who seemed to at least pretend to care for the next 20 days. This led to public policy executive Carolyn Strom sending out a polite WTF query. Several employees noted that there was tension between the comms policy team, who had little or less control over moderation, and the safety and trust team. The safety and trust team, as we'll see, is led by a guy named Yoel Roth. Yoel Roth is a far left winger who's very fond of shutting down information he doesn't like. Strom's note returned the answer that the laptop story had been removed for violation of the company's quote-unquote hacked materials policy. And you'll remember that this was largely driven by quote-unquote intelligence experts who had decided that they were going to suggest that this was all Russian disinformation based on literally nothing. And people like John Brennan, the former head of the CIA, out there saying, well, this is probably Russian disinformation. When, on the base of nothing, there's a letter signed by 100 intelligence experts put out there by the Biden campaign saying that the Hunter Biden laptop really was it was obviously a Russian plant or something. They based that on nothing. Although, according to Matt Taibbi, several sources recalled hearing about a general warning from federal law enforcement that summer about possible foreign hacks, there's no evidence of any government involvement in the laptop story. In fact, that might have been the problem. The decision was made at the highest levels of the company, but without the knowledge of CEO Jack Dorsey, with former head of legal policy and trust, Vijaya Gaddy playing a key role. You'll remember Vijaya Gaddy from such shows as Joe Rogan's, where he just turned her in knots, along with Tim Pool, over their failure of content standards. They just sort of randomly suspend people for no apparent reason. And again, this is the middle management problem. You're Jack Dorsey. You hire a bunch of people to handle the day-to-day. And those people who handle the day-to-do do a bad job and shield you from all of the rough decision-making. They just freelanced it, is how one former employee characterized the decision. Hacking was the excuse, but within a few hours, pretty much everyone realized that wasn't going to hold, but no one had the guts to reverse it. You can see the confusion in a lengthy exchange, which ends up including Gaddy and former trust and safety chief, Yoel Roth. Comms official Trent Kennedy writes, I'm struggling to understand the policy basis for marking this as unsafe. By this point, everyone knew this was effed, said one former employee, but the response was essentially to err on the side of continuing to err. Yoel Roth wrote, for example, the policy basis is hacked materials, though as discussed, this is an emerging situation where the facts remain unclear, given the severe risks here and lessons of 2016, we're erring on the side of including a warning and preventing this content from being amplified. I mean, given the lessons of 2016. Again, this was part of the propaganda effort on behalf of Democrats in the media, which is that 2016 was decided by Russian disinformation. And so they were like, we are not going to allow even the even the remotest whiff of Russian disinformation. And so we're going to shut down the story, even if there is no basis for calling it Russian disinformation. Vijaya Gaddy said, what is the warning that will come up? And Yoel Roth said, when you click the link, you'll see the generic unsafe URL. Not ideal, but that's the only thing that we have. Ian Plunkett, another member of the team, said, whatever we do in the comms, let's make it clear we're proactively but cautiously interpreting this through the lens of our hacked materials policy and allowing the link with a warning and significant reduction of spread. Former vice president of global comms, Brandon Borman, asked, can we truthfully claim this is part of the policy? To which former deputy general counsel Jim Baker again seemed to advise staying the non-course because, quote unquote, caution is warranted. So basically, they'd been intimidated over at Twitter, the middle management, into believing that it is better to shut down the material than to allow the dissemination of the material. The burden of proof was to prove that the material was not Russian disinformation. The burden of proof was not on Twitter to provide any evidence whatsoever that the Hunter Biden story was actually Russian disinformation. Well, Taibbi points out that there was actually one humorous exchange on day one when Democratic Congressman Ro Khanna reached out to Vijaya Gaddy to gently suggest she hop on the phone to talk about the backlash re-speech. Khanna was the only Democratic official Taibbi could find in the files who expressed concern. Ro Khanna, by the way, I will say this, nice guy. He's been on my show before. We had a good discussion about minimum wage. He apparently emerges as the hero of this story. Gaddy replied quickly, immediately diving into the weeds of Twitter policy, unaware that Khanna was more worried about the Bill of Rights. So Khanna kept saying, like, isn't this sort of a First Amendment violation if you are doing this at the behest of government agencies? And Twitter's like, no, 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 this is Twitter policy. And Khanna keeps trying to say, is this a First Amendment issue? He said, hope you're well, Vijaya. This seems a violation of First Amendment principles. If there's a hack of classified information or other information that could expose a serious war crime and the New York Times was to publish it, I think the New York Times should have that right. A journalist should not be held accountable for the illegal actions of the source unless they actively aided the hack. To restrict the distribution of that material, especially regarding a presidential candidate, seems not in keeping with the principles of New York Times versus Sullivan. I say this is a total Biden partisan, convinced he didn't do anything wrong. 
The story now has become more about censorship than relatively innocuous emails. It's become a bigger deal than it would have also been. This is, this is correct. Rokana was actually correct. Within a day, the head of public policy, Lauren Culberton, received a ghastly letter report from Carl Jabo of the research from NetChoice, which had already pulled 12 members of Congress, nine Republicans and three Democrats from the House Judiciary Committee to Representative Judy Chu's office. NetChoice let Twitter know a bloodbath awaited in upcoming Hill hearings with members saying that this whole thing was a tipping point. Jabba reported to Twitter that some Hill figures were characterizing the laptop story as tech's access Hollywood moment. Jabba's letter contained chilling passages relaying Democratic lawmakers' attitudes. They wanted more moderation. And as for the Bill of Rights, quote unquote, it's not absolute. Apparently, the Democrats were complaining the company was inept, that they let conservatives muddy the water and made the Biden campaign look corrupt, even though Biden was innocent. And they linked this to Hillary Clinton's email scandal. They said that because she did nothing wrong and that ended up affecting the 2016 election, now we have to shut down the information. So what exactly does all of this show? Well, what it shows is a very, very warm relationship between Twitter's middle management and everybody in the Democratic Party, except for apparently Ro Khanna. What it doesn't show is full-on First Amendment violations in the nature of the government itself intervening and telling Twitter that it had to turn off the spigot on First Amendment activity. And that is not what the Twitter files show. However, that is the dog that's not barking here. Hey, Andy McCarthy has a very good piece in the New York Post pointing this out. He says, stop looking for a smoking gun. That's not how this game works. Just as it did in 2016, the Democratic Party colluded during the 2020 presidential campaign with FBI leadership, its like-minded transnational progressives in the loose-lipped community of current and former national security officials and the media. The objective in 2020 was to try to drag a, deep, a weak, deeply compromised Democratic candidate across the finish line. The scheme worked in 2020 where it failed in 2016. A big part of the difference was Democrats and their collaborators put 2020 emphasis on social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook. The result was the systematic suppression of the Biden family corruption scandal. The staggering millions of dollars that are now known to have been poured into the Biden coffers from agents of such authoritarian anti-American regimes as Russia and China and corrupt ones like Ukraine. Andy McCarthy says Joe Biden is in it up to his neck, although the media Democrat complex continues branding the scandal as the Hunter Biden probe to obscure Joe Biden's complicity. He says, don't look for a smoking gun. We're not going to see an FBI document that says, tell Twitter the Biden evidence is Russian disinformation. When the new chief twit, Elon Musk, released the so-called Twitter files over the weekend, Matt Taibbi's consequent threat of reporting observed there's no specific evidence of a specific warning to social media that Biden information was sourced to Russia or hacked. However, there is significant evidence of FBI collusion in the scheme. Because the FBI doesn't actually have to issue a specific warning. They just say, by the way, there's lots of Russian disinformation going around. And then all of the social media bros, they pick up on this and like, well, you know, we did get really, really bashed around for Russian disinformation last time around. So all you really need is a bunch of former or current intelligence officials going public and saying, this could be Russian disinformation. And all the social media tech bros pick up on this. Did the FBI actually say the Biden evidence was Russian disinformation? It came pretty close, says Andy McCarthy. On Joe Rogan's podcast, Mark Zuckerberg said Facebook restricted the Hunter Biden revelations due to an FBI warning. Just as there had been a lot of Russian propaganda in the 2016 election, Facebook should be on high alert that there's about to be some kind of dump that's similar to that, which is exactly what the FBI said. All right, you guys, the rest of the show is continuing right now. You're not going to want to miss it. We'll be taking your phone calls. Plus, we will be getting into the Democrats recapitulating their 2024 primary schedule, lining it up for maybe Kamala Harris. If you're not a member, click the link in the description and join us.